Hello everyone, welcome to Ancient Greece and Rome. In this video, we're going to discuss the Egyptian civilization. The Egyptians were a neighbor of the Greek and Roman civilizations, and the Egyptians were an important trading partner, influence, and rival for the Greek and Roman civilizations. We'll discuss the origins of the Egyptian civilization, starting around 3100 BCE, and some of its similarities and differences with other contemporary civilizations. Then we'll discuss the Old Kingdom from about 2700 to 2200 BCE, which was the period of the pyramids. We'll also discuss the introduction of artificial mummification in ancient Egyptian society. After that, we'll discuss the Middle Kingdom and the Intermediate Periods, and how the Egyptian civilization came into increased conflict with other civilizations and empires in the region. After that, we'll cover the New Kingdom from about 1570 to 1079 BCE. The New Kingdom is often thought of as being the Golden Age of the Egyptian civilization, as they reached the peak of their monumental architecture in terms of their temples and tombs, as well as the sophistication of their mummification techniques. Also, some of the most famous Egyptian rulers came from the New Kingdom. Finally, we'll discuss the late period from about 10,079 BCE to about the 300s CE. During this period, the Egyptian civilization lost its independence. It also experienced increased cultural syncretism with other civilizations, especially the Greeks and the Romans. Put simply, ancient Egypt was the civilization of the Nile River. The Nile River was the lifeblood of the Egyptian civilization. It provided water and hydration, as well as transportation as well. The Nile River would flood, but its floods were far more predictable than the floods of the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in Mesopotamia. The Nile River flooded seasonally, usually from about May to about October. The Egyptians used these flood periods, called the inundation, to bring water and nutrients to the soil which they called Kemi or Kemet. Agriculture was easier for the Egyptians than it was for the Mesopotamians, allowing them to put more time into building larger, more extravagant monumental architecture, especially temples and tombs. Egypt was divided into two regions, Upper Southern Egypt and Lower Northern Egypt, seen here on this map. Upper Egypt, Lower Egypt. It can be confusing to some people because Lower Egypt is in the north and Upper Egypt is in the south if you're using a north-oriented map. Lower Egypt is dominated by the Nile Delta region. As the Nile River widens and dumps into the Mediterranean Sea, Upper Egypt is significantly drier and possesses stone cliffs close to the river banks. The Nile River also possesses a series of rapids called cataracts, seen here in the top left, which make traversing the Nile River more difficult as travelers sail southward upriver towards the source of the Nile River in what is now present-day Uganda. Egyptian cultural territory tapered off around Abu Simbel, shown here, after which the Nubian civilization began. Although during the New Kingdom, at the height of ancient Egypt's power, the Egyptians expanded briefly south of Abu Simbel. Before we continue, I want to discuss pre-dynastic Egypt or prehistoric Egypt. That is what life was like in Egypt before the development of writing. Archaeologists and historians um, have to work together here because there's no written records from this period. 
but they generally think that uh, the average Egyptian in the pre-dynastic period lived in uh, a small community or small village along the Nile River, and that these small communities and villages were eventually uh, consolidated into the kingdoms of Upper and Lower Egypt, which would be reunited later, beginning uh, the Old Kingdom period in Egyptian history. Pre-dynastic Egyptians uh, would have practiced agriculture and uh, probably traveled by boat up and down the Nile River. We think they had boats because we found uh, boat figurines in their graves. Um, they probably also traded with other cultures in Africa and the Near East. Based on uh, material culture, we found um, artifacts from other parts of the world uh, in their burial sites and even uh, tattoos on uh, their mummified remains show animals and objects from other parts of the world, all of which would suggest that uh, pre-dynastic Egyptians, even though they lived in these small communities, they had contact with uh, other parts of the world. On the subject of uh, burial, uh, pre-dynastic Egyptians would have buried their dead in the dry desert stands and would have basically uh, practiced a form of natural mummification. There is some debate, of course, about whether the pre-dynastic Egyptians were uh, attempting to preserve the bodies of their dead using the dry desert sands, or if uh, the pre-dynastic Egyptians just discovered mummification by accident. But we'll discuss uh, mummification uh, throughout this video. Many people think that the pre-dynastic Egyptians believed in an afterlife, just like later Egyptians. And they think this because the pre-dynastic Egyptians typically buried their dead with uh, grave goods, things like pottery, jewelry, uh, flints, uh, sometimes even food, things that the deceased could use in the afterlife. And keep in mind that what we know about pre-dynastic Egyptians comes primarily from archaeological research, putting together artifacts and objects that we found try to recreate their lives. We don't have a uh, written language for the Egyptians at this point in their history. And generally the most significant archeological finds of uh, pre-dynastic um, Egyptian life come from about the 3000s, about the mid 3000s to be exact, from what is known as the uh, Gerza culture. Now on this slide, we see images of a uh, female figurine found uh, at a pre-dynastic Egyptian site it's believed to be of a goddess of some kind, you can see here. And also this is a, uh, a pot, an example of uh, ceramic work that has been decorated as well. This is the Gebelin man. He's an example of a pre-dynastic Egyptian mummy. Um, we believe he lived around the year 3400 BCE and that he died in his early 20s from a stab wound in the back. Um, he was buried with a variety of grave goods, including uh, pottery, uh, some jewelry, and uh, flints and other grave goods. Uh, the Gebelin man's grave shows a culture that is transitioning away from the Neolithic, from the uh, Stone Age, and moving into the beginnings of uh, the Copper Age, or the use of uh, copper technology. The Gebelin man was buried in the fetal position. Uh, a lot of the uh, mummies and other uh, human remains from this period are buried in a uh, similar uh, posture, uh, the fetal position, perhaps because uh, a person enters life in this position and they leave uh, life in this position as well, sort of poetic. Um, both male and female mummies have been found from this period. Uh, typically they're buried with grave goods uh, something that's interesting about the Gebelin man is he uh, probably had red hair in life. It's possible he was uh, not from Egypt. He may have migrated there from someplace else. It's hard to say for sure, being that we don't have uh, a lot of really any written texts from the Egyptians during this period. Another interesting thing about the Gebelin man as well is uh, he has tattoos. Uh, he has tattoos particularly of a uh, Barbary sheep or a sheep that lives in North Africa. So perhaps he came from North Africa or someplace to the north. It's also possible that the uh, Egyptians were trading with people from North Africa and that's what inspired the Gebelin to have that ta tattoo in life. 
below the image of the Gebelin man, you can see uh, a boat model. Uh, this is a boat model um, found in a similar uh, burial site. Um, this model suggests that the Egyptians um, had access to boats and that they used boats to travel up and down the Nile. This palette depicts Menes, the legendary first pharaoh of Egypt. Menes is a somewhat mythic figure, similar to Romulus of the ancient Roman civilization. Archaeologists do not agree on whether Menes was a historical person or if he was perhaps a mythical composite of multiple figures. These palettes show Menes defeating his enemies and uniting the kingdom of Egypt. He's shown here wearing the crown of Upper Egypt, and on the other side of the palette he's shown wearing the crown of Lower Egypt, to signify that he ruled both realms. He attacks his enemies and crushes them with a club. He is also por portrayed with Horus, the falcon god who represents the pharaohs. Egyptian historians linked the Egyptian dynasties, of which there were over 30, all the way back to Menes, who, if he was in fact a real person, probably lived around the year 3100 BCE. Here are some additional images of Menes and his crown. Here's the crown of Upper Egypt. Here's the crown of Lower Egypt. Here's the double crown worn by later pharaohs to symbolize the uniting of Upper and Lower Egypt. This is thought to be a bust of Menes. Once again, keep in mind that he is likely a mythical figure and a composite of many people. Now we'll discuss the Old Kingdom of Egypt. The Old Kingdom lasted from roughly 2700 to 22000 BCE. The Old Kingdom was defined by monumental tombs and related buildings, including mastabas, pyramids, and the Sphinx. You can see the pyramids here, the Sphinx here, and you can see mastabas, smaller tombs built around the Great Pyramids. Famous Egyptians of the Old Kingdom include the architect Imhotep, who designed Djoser's Step Pyramid. Here are some Step Pyramids. Queen Hetep Heres, mother of the Pharaoh Khufu, for whom the Great Pyramid was built. Archaeologists think that Queen Hetep Heres may have been one of the first Egyptians to be artificially mummified. Although her body has not been found, they found canopic jars containing her organs, suggesting there was an attempt to artificially preserve her remains. Mastabas were the first Egyptian monumental tombs. Mastabas take their name from the House of Stability, or the House of Eternity, highlighting that the Mastaba tombs were meant to be a house for the dead. Here you can see a diagram of the mastabas. Essentially, they were short, flat roof tombs with burial chambers shown here. Here is a royal mastaba that's larger and contains multiple levels. It also contains smaller mastabas on the edge in which the pharaoh's servants and warriors would be buried. During the Old Kingdom, there is significant evidence that the ancient Egyptians, like the ancient Sumerians whom we discussed in a previous video, practiced human sacrifice so that their deceased pharaohs would have attendance in the afterlife. This practice died out over time in ancient Egypt. We'll discuss ancient Egyptian burial rituals further in this video. Some archaeologists think that mastabas form the basis of the first pyramids. 
they think that Egyptians, early on in the Old Kingdom, built a series of mastabas on top of each other, which would eventually evolve into pyramids later in the period. Here are some diagrams of the step pyramids, namely the step pyramid of Djoser, which was designed by Imhotep, mentioned previously. You can see that just like the old mastabas, the burial chambers are beneath the pyramid and beneath the mastabas. They're not inside of the stack mastabas. Old Kingdom Egyptian architects continued to experiment with tomb design, developing the bed pyramid of Seneferu by about 2600 BCE. As you can see here, the burial chamber of the Bent Pyramid is within the pyramid itself. It's not beneath the pyramid, as was the case with the step pyramids shown on the previous slide. Now we'll discuss the Great Pyramid of Khufu, built around roughly 2570 BCE. Khufu's pyramid is much larger, and it is a true pyramid. being of a triangular shape rather than a bent shape like the previous Pyramid of Seneferu. Like the Pyramid of Seneferu though, the burial chamber is built within the pyramid itself, seen here. The entrance is on the outside. The Old Kingdom pharaohs intended for their pyramids to be temples where their descendants would worship the deceased pharaohs as gods. Unfortunately for the pharaohs, these massive pyramids, which were intended to memorialize the dead, made the dead a target for grave robbers. We'll discuss that more later. The Egyptians of the Old Kingdom, in addition to building monumental tombs, also made other types of artwork. They made sculptures and they made wall paintings, two-dimensional art. The art of the Old Kingdom is simple compared to the artwork of later kingdoms, but there are some continuities that can be seen in Old Kingdom art that will persist throughout ancient Egyptian history. Namely, Egyptian 2D artists' preference for portraying their subjects in profile form, that is from the side. There are not many examples of ancient Egyptian artwork that portray their subjects looking back at the viewer. The few examples that we have found are from much later after the Old Kingdom, during a period in which ancient Egypt no longer had its independence. Ancient Egyptians also made sculptures during the Old Kingdom as well. Their sculptures were fairly simple compared to the sculptures of later periods. They were usually carved from single pieces of stone rather than being composites. They were generally life-sized and not monumental, although there are exceptions like the Sphinx, which was built to guard the pyramids. The physical features are simple and stylized. They're fairly static. They don't contain the kind of detail and movement that you would see in, for example, Greco-Roman sculpture or even Egyptian sculpture of later pyramid, periods. Subjects are usually posed with one foot forward, as seen here and here. This pose will be popular in later periods, but is iconic in the Old Kingdom. The ancient Egyptians developed a writing system during the Old Kingdom as well. The Egyptian writing system consisted of pictograms called hieroglyphics. Unlike the Mesopotamian civilizations, which phased out their pictographic systems, the Egyptians kept their hieroglyphics in use, especially for religious purposes, as late as the 400s of the Common Era during the Roman period. Over time, the Egyptians did develop simpler scripts like hieratic and demotic, as seen in the Rosetta Stone here. 
on the right. The Rosetta Stone contains script in Egyptian hieroglyphics, everyday Egyptian script, specifically hieratic and demotic, and then the Greek alphabet, seen at the bottom. By the way, the Rosetta Stone is from the 100s to 200s BCE, during Greek rule of Egypt. The Egyptians' choice to preserve their hieroglyphic writing system highlights the continuity of their civilization and their culture's emphasis on religion and spirituality. Hieroglyphics were translated in the 1820s by Jean-Francois Champollion. After the discovery of the Rosetta Stone during the Napoleonic Wars, which were fought between France and Great Britain, partially in Egypt. Champollion used the Greek alphabet to decode the meaning of the hieroglyphics. Now we'll discuss the ancient Egyptian religion. For the most part, ancient Egypt, from the Old Kingdom through the New Kingdom and even into the Roman period, was a polytheistic society. They worshipped a large pantheon of gods and goddesses, but there were several goddesses and gods that were very important to the Egyptians and received particular emphasis in their religion. Most of these gods were developed during the Old Kingdom and would continue to be worshipped for thousands of years. One of the most important of these gods was Ra, the sun god, shown at center left, and here as well. Ra is portrayed with the sun over his body, and he's also portrayed with the head of a falcon. The falcon, remember, was a symbol of the pharaoh. The Egyptians also worshipped Amun, the sky god, who is often portrayed with blue skin because he represents the sky. They also worshipped Osiris, god of the dead, who was represented with green skin as a sign of his mummification, as you can see here on the right. They also worshipped Anubis, the god of mummification, who had the head of a jackal. We're not entirely sure why Anubis, the god of mummification, was represented with the head of a jackal, but some archaeologists think this may have been because desert jackals would have fed on the bodies of the dead if they were left unburied. Here you can see Horus with a falcon head. Horus represents the pharaohs, whom the ancient Egyptians worshipped as gods. Some archaeologists think that Old Kingdom artists portrayed these gods as full animals and that these anthropomorphized images that you see in this slide were not developed until later. But there's disagreement on this point. In addition to worshipping many gods, the ancient Egyptians worshipped many goddesses as well. Some of the most famous goddesses they worshipped included Isis, the goddess of Osiris, who was also the goddess of motherhood, here on the far left. Hathor, the sky goddess, was worshipped as well. She is portrayed with the sun above her head, but also with cattle horns. Sometimes she is portrayed with a cow's head. Two other goddesses were Sekhmet and Bastet, the goddesses of health and medicine. They are often portrayed with the heads of lionesses or domestic cats. Cats were very important to the ancient Egyptians, having spiritual meaning. Scholars and archaeologists think that the ancient Egyptians may have begun to worship cats because cats helped protect their stored grain from pests like rats and mice. 
It's also worth noting that Egyptian goddesses are not portrayed as being weaker than the male gods, which is a big difference in a lot of other ancient Mediterranean societies, which had goddesses, but usually portrayed their goddesses as being subservient to their male gods. Scholars and archaeologists think this decision to portray ancient Egyptian gods and goddesses on a similar footing may have been because of the comparative gender egalitarianism of ancient Egyptian society, which had several female pharaohs. We'll talk more about these female pharaohs later in the lecture. Humans had practiced the preservation of dead bodies for millennia, even before the unification of Egypt in 3100 BCE. Over time, though, the ancient Egyptians developed sophisticated artificial techniques for preserving the bodies of the dead. And eventually, artificial mummification became a core part of the ancient Egyptian culture. Early in Egyptian history, the dry sands of Egypt would have naturally preserved the deceased. But as the Egyptians started to inter their elite dead in tombs, they would have needed to use artificial means to pre pre prevent decomposition. They began preserving their dead using artificial mummification during the Old Kingdom. There are few confirmed surviving examples of mummies from the Old Kingdom, as most tombs were robbed and their mummies presumably were destroyed. The best example of artificial mummification is the canopic jars of Afanmut, mother of Khufu. Her canopic jars are shown in the background. Egyptian artificial mummification would reach its peak during the New Kingdom in terms of technical sophistication and level of preservation. Mummification gets its name from the Persian word mumaya for wax or bitumen because of the dark tar-like color of desiccated mummies. This is an example of a mummy from the Old Kingdom. It was discovered at Abydos in the 1920s CE, so about 100 years ago. Uh, it has since uh, been dated to uh, having been made uh, sometime between the 2300s and the 2100s uh, BCE, meaning the person um, who became this mummy lived and died sometime between the 2300s and the 2100s uh, BCE. By the way, this is towards the end of the New Kingdom. Some interesting things to note about this mummy. Um, this mummy was buried on its side in its sarcophagus. Uh, it was also buried with uh, this headrest here. This is not an original headrest. This was added uh, later on as a, a replica to illustrate how the, uh, the burial would have looked. Um, during this period, mummies were probably not interred in um, anthropoid or human-shaped coffins because of the fact they were buried on their side. Uh, in order to be properly interred in a anthropoid coffin, the deceased would need to be uh, buried in the supine position, that is, lying flat on their back. And mummies are not uh, interred in the supine position until much later in Egyptian history, probably the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom was also when the Egyptians kind of reached their zenith of uh, skill and ability in uh, making uh, mummies. And we'll discuss the general process of mummification, um, its similarities and how it changed a little bit with time on the next slide. Lastly, this mummy is uh, housed at the Carlos Museum of Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Here is a diagram describing the mummification process used throughout ancient Egyptian history. The ancient Egyptians would remove the organs of the dead. They would eviscerate the bodies, saving some of the organs by placing them in canopic jars, but others they would discard, like the brain, which they did not think had any value. 
As you can see here, the brain will be removed through the nose. They would fill the body cavities with tree resins and with wrapped textiles to try to give the body a more lifelike appearance after evisceration. Then the body would be packed in salt and dried for between 40 and 70 days. The dried body would then be washed, covered in oils and resins, and then it would be wrapped in linen wrappings. After this, a death mask would be placed on its head and adornments and amulets designed to protect the deceased and guide them into the afterlife would be placed in the wrappings. The mummification process varied somewhat based on the level of wealth of the deceased. Everyday Egyptians might pay for a very simple mummification if they paid for artificial mummification at all, whereas pharaohs would be carefully and meticulously mummified and their bodies would have been buried with many amulets that would have been very valuable and very tempting for grave robbers as well. Here's a modern artist's reconstruction of what the mummification process would have looked like. This scene is probably from the New Kingdom based on the art shown in the image. Mummification, especially of the elite classes, was overseen by the priests because it was an immensely religious process. As was the case in ancient Sumerian society, ancient Egyptian priests usually shaved their heads and beards to distinguish themselves from people of the secular classes. After the mummy had been fully dried and wrapped and decorated with amulets, the priests would then perform what was called the opening of the mouth ceremony. That way, the deceased would be able to see, hear, smell, and taste in the afterlife. These rituals are described in documents like the ancient Egyptian Book of the Dead. The ancient Egyptians believed that the soul, known as the Ba or the Ka, would leave the body of the deceased, but then it would return before the deceased could go on to the afterlife. The soul needed to be able to recognize the body of the deceased, which is why the Egyptians practiced mummification. The Egyptians believed in an afterlife, and like many other cultures, they believed that only the good could enter a heavenly paradise with Osiris, the god of the dead. The deceased, guided by Anubis, seen here, would be led before Osiris, and they would have their heart weighed. A person with a light heart could go on to the, a peaceful and happy afterlife, whereas a person with a heavy heart would be denied entrance to Osiris's court, and their heart would be eaten by the crocodile and lion-headed devourer. This is why ancient Egyptian embalmers removed organs except for the heart, which they kept in the body. Around 2200 BCE, the Old Kingdom came to an end. As the Old Kingdom broke up into smaller realms, namely the realms of Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. Upper Egypt was ruled from Thebes and Lower Egypt was ruled from Memphis. During this period, Egypt as a whole experienced a series of very violent civil wars. Some archaeologists and scholars think that during the first intermediate period, robbers broke into pyramids and tombs to steal valuables that had once belonged to previous pharaohs. Other archaeologists think that these robberies happened much sooner during the Old Kingdom, and they may have even been an inside job, as the builders and architects of the tombs broke in to steal 
the valuable gold and silver amulets of the pharaohs. During the first intermediate period, art and sculpture was fairly simple. Not much innovation was made due to Egyptian society being more occupied with warfare. The first intermediate period came to an end when the Theban pharaohs reunited Upper and Lower Egypt under Mentehotep II around about 2040 BCE. With the reuniting of Upper and Lower Egypt, the Middle Kingdom began. The Middle Kingdom lasted from about 2040 to 1650 BCE. Art, sculpture, and religion did not change much from the Old Kingdom during the Middle Kingdom. 2D art and sculpture was much plainer in the Middle Kingdom than it was in the later New Kingdom, but it was a little bit more colorful and experimental than it had been in the Old Kingdom centuries earlier. The biggest innovations in Egyptian culture and society during the Middle Kingdom came from other nearby civilizations who began migrating to Egypt around the 1900s BCE. The Middle Kingdom came to an end not due to internal civil wars, as was the case with the Old Kingdom, but from a foreign invasion. The Hyksos, a people from the Near East, invaded Egypt around the 1600s BCE, bringing the Middle Kingdom to an end. Here are some examples of sculpture from the Middle Kingdom. As you can see, it's still very stylized like Old Kingdom sculpture, but it's a bit more varied. You see different types of poses. You also see the use of colors as well. In short, ancient Egyptian sculpture in the Middle Kingdom was evolving, but it had not yet reached its peak. There was more innovation with 2D ancient Egyptian art during the Middle Kingdom. The art was still fairly simple and still primarily focused on portraying profiles, but it was significantly more colorful than in the Old Kingdom. During the Middle Kingdom, the Egyptians also began to portray non-Egyptians with greater frequency, reflecting the immigration and trade of the period. Sub-Saharan Africans are usually portrayed with darker skin, as seen here. Near Easters and Europeans are portrayed with lighter skin and full beards. Egyptians usually portrayed themselves with skin darker than Near Easter, Easterners and Europeans, but lighter than that of Sub-Saharan Africans. They also did not portray themselves with full beards, but with males with small beards. As far as clothing goes, the Egyptians usually portrayed themselves in white or red with no patterns in their fabric, whereas they usually portrayed Near Easterners and Europeans with vibrant pattern clothing, as seen here. There are images of black Egyptians Sub-Saharan African people dressed in Egyptian clothing and as members of Egyptian society. There are also images of people of Near Eastern and possibly European descent portrayed in Egyptian garb, reflecting that Egypt was a multi-ethnic and even multi-racial society and an important crossroads between Asia, Africa, and Europe. Around the 1650s BCE, a Near Eastern people called the Hyksos invaded Egypt, bringing an end to the Middle Kingdom. The Hyksos were able to defeat the Egyptians and their allies because they had better military technology, specifically chariots, which were very important in ancient warfare as we discussed in a previous lecture. The Hyksos 
also relied more on bows and arrows and javelins than the ancient Egyptians did. The ancient Egyptians generally preferred melee weapons like spears and swords. Keep in mind that both the Egyptians and the Hyksos would have been using bronze weapons, as this is still the Bronze Age. During the Second Intermediate Period, from 1650 to 1550 BCE, the ancient Egyptians worked to regain their independence and to defeat the Hyksos and other foreign occupiers. The Egyptians accomplished this by adopting many of the military tactics of the Hyksos and their enemies, including the use of chariots and the increased reliance on ranged weapons, especially bows and arrows and javelins. You can see a bow and arrow here, and you can see a chariot here. They also began wearing more armor as well, as shown by the pharaoh wearing his blue war crown in a type of scale armor, seen in this piece of 2D art and in this modern recreation. These military improvements allowed Egypt to gain independence, become more warlike and militaristic, and expand its territory and reach the height of its power in the New Kingdom. The New Kingdom of Egypt from circa 1550 to 1352 BCE was the peak of Egyptian military strength and cultural achievement and influence. The empire stretched beyond its original borders, reaching Kush in the south, Syria in the northeast, and Libya in the west. Some famous Egyptian rulers of the New Kingdom were Ramses the Great, Queen Hatshepsut, and King Tutankhamun also known as King Tut. Egyptians did not build pyramids during this period. Instead, they preferred to build elaborate but secret tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Most of these tombs would be robbed as well, but they probably remained intact for longer periods than the pyramids did. Egyptian art, sculpture, architecture, and mummification reached their highest level of sophistication during the New Kingdom. Invasions and the Bronze Age collapse weakened the New Kingdom, beginning the Third Intermediate Period of circa 1069 through 664 BCE, after which point Egypt would no longer be an independent civilization, being ruled by a long list of foreign powers. Here are some examples of two-dimensional art from the New Kingdom. There is some continuity from previous periods. Once again, they prefer to illustrate in profile style. On the whole, though, the art is more detailed, sophisticated, lifelike, and expressive. I especially like the facial expression on this figure here. She almost seems to be looking back at the viewer. You'll also see that additional colors are used. For example, women are often portrayed with lighter skin than men, a trend you see in many ancient Mediterranean civilizations. There's also more movement in 2D artwork from this period, especially in military artwork, which we'll look at in a moment. Here we can see an example of 2D artwork from the New Kingdom. This is believed to be an image of Ramses the Great attacking the Syrians, he, shown here retreating. Ramses is also shown with sub-Saharan African allies as well. We can see the movement in this image with the horses rearing back as they pull Ramses' chariot, and we can see him drawing a bow to let loose upon his enemies. We can also see elements of a mosaic here, showing that the Egyptians of the New Kingdom were developing artistic techniques used by other ancient Mediterranean civilizations. This is a good opportunity to discuss daily life in ancient Egypt. Everyday life for the average Egyptian would not have changed very much from the Old Kingdom to the New Kingdom. 
although there would have been periods of less stability and interruption during the intermediate periods. The average ancient Egyptian, like his or her compatriots in Mesopotamia, would have been involved in agricultural labor, seen here. The ancient Egyptians grew wheat and a variety of fruits and vegetables in the Nile River Valley, planting after the inundation and harvesting before the floodwaters came. The ancient Egyptians would store their grain. They would pay taxes to the pharaohs and to the priests, and they would take some of the grain for themselves to make bread. The ancient Egyptians also used grains to make beer as well, as did other ancient Near Eastern civilizations. The ancient Egyptians also had a sweet tooth. They liked to eat dates, shown here, and they also kept bees for making honey. Consequently, the mummified remains of ancient Egyptians, especially from the upper classes, show significant signs of tooth decay from a diet rich in sweet foods, but also because the ancient Egyptians may have unwittingly added sand to their flour as they ground their wheat. While we're on the subject of daily life in ancient Egypt, I want to talk about um, ancient Egyptian medical and scientific knowledge. We generally believe that ancient Egyptians had very sophisticated medical knowledge and uh, infrastructure by the standards of the day, and that ancient Egyptian physicians, that is, uh, doctors and nurses, were regarded as being some of the best in the ancient world. The Egyptians knew about diseases, they had a good understanding of human anatomy by the standards of the period, obviously. Um, they also had a uh, knowledge of surgical procedures and even of preventing infections uh, through things like hygiene. Um, it's possible that mummification helped them understand uh, more about the human body, how uh, basic human anatomy worked, how to um, conduct uh, certain types of surgical procedures, and how to uh, prevent uh, infection or decomposition. And all of this they would have sort of learned um, through mummification and then brought that into their uh, knowledge of living people. There's also strong evidence to indicate that both men and women uh, practiced medicine in uh, ancient Egypt, serving as both doctors and nurses, and that um, ancient Egyptian medical practitioners also even specialized in certain types of the body or certain types of medicine, a lot like uh, specialists do today. Um, physicians had high status in Egyptian society. Um, they were generally uh, viewed on the same level as priests. Uh, and they were expected to study religion and spirituality as well. Even as the ancient Egyptians uh, understood uh, certain elements of human anatomy and human physiology, they uh, ultimately believed that diseases were caused by spiritual forces and that their uh, medical treatments and procedures were as much um, spiritual as they were scientific. And the Egyptians recorded their discoveries and their treatments on uh, papyrus scrolls, and then Greek and Roman scholars would visit Egypt and study these uh, Egyptian texts and talk with um, Egyptian physicians, taking these uh, um, bits of knowledge they got uh, from the Egyptians back to uh, the, the Greek and Roman civilizations. Ancient Egyptian society was highly stratified. It was dependent on the labor of both its agricultural peasant classes as well as slaves. Some archaeologists and scholars think that the Egyptians' wars, particularly in the New Kingdom, may have been inspired by a desire to capture people who would be turned into slaves, as seen in this relief here. Upper-class Egyptians, like the vizier and the nobles, lived fairly well in ancient Egyptian society. They ate well, in some cases, ate to the point of developing diseases like heart disease and diabetes, as seen by their mummified remains. They also had parties where they listened to music and danced. At these parties, they often wore oil-based ointment on their heads, which would melt in the heat, but would make their hair luscious and soft. Ancient Egyptian men and women 
often wore makeup around their eyes called coal. Archaeologists think they may have done this to ward off bugs and flies that would have flown into their eyes. Ancient Egyptian men and women, especially in the upper classes, often wore wigs as well. Some ancient Egyptians, particularly of the priestly class, shaved their heads to separate themselves from Egyptians of the secular classes. Ancient Egyptians also preferred to wear white clothing without patterns, although they often wore pleats in their clothing as a form of decoration. The Egyptians usually associated pattern textiles with foreign civilizations. Although ancient Egyptian society was highly stratified like its neighbors in terms of labor and slavery, ancient Egyptian society was significantly more egalitarian in terms of the rights it extended to women. As highlighted by Egypt's multiple female rulers. One of the most notable was Hatshepsut, who was both queen and pharaoh. She ruled Egypt from about 1479 to 1458 BCE. It was originally intended for her to be regent for her son, Thutmose III, but she took control of the country and ruled as pharaoh until her death in 1458 BCE. She's generally considered to be a very successful pharaoh as well. Her greatest accomplishment was organizing a trade expedition in alliance with Punt, a principality south of Egypt near present-day Somalia. Hatshepsut dressed herself and attired herself as a pharaoh, wearing the headdress of the pharaoh and also wearing a fake beard. Archaeologists thought they found her mummy, but recent findings have cast doubt on their initial conclusion. Once again, Hatshepsut was one of many important female rulers in Egypt. Egypt was a patriarchal society, but it also gave women quite a bit more rights and quite a bit more freedom than many of its neighbors. An image of her possible mummy will be on the next slide. This is an image of the mummy of Hatshepsut with Dr. Zahi Hawass, a leading Egyptian Egyptologist looking on. Dr. Hawass was one of the main proponents of this mummy belonging to Hatshepsut, but other archeologists disagree. Here are some other important women who were rulers in ancient Egypt. On the left is Nefertiti, wife of Pharaoh Akhenaten, and a possible mother of King Tutankhamun. Her possible but not confirmed mummy will be shown on the next slide. This famous bust of Hatshepsut shows her wearing the crown, specifically the war crown of the Pharaoh, suggesting that she may have briefly ruled as a Pharaoh. On the right is Queen T, the mother of Akhenaten, and one of King Tut's grandmothers. Her mummy, which has been confirmed, will be displayed on the next slide as well. On the left is an image thought to be the mummified remains of Nefertiti, although archaeologists disagree. The mummy shows significant signs of both pre-mortem and post-mortem damage including a blow to the face and to the chest. The blow to the face was probably what caused this woman to die, which would fit with the theory that Nefertiti briefly ruled as Pharaoh. She may have suffered from battle wounds leading to her death, although we don't know for sure, and scholars debate this um, point. We also don't even fully know for sure if this is the mummified remains of Nefertiti. Artists have created facial reconstructions of what Nefertiti may have looked like in life. 
but their renditions rely heavily on the bust of Nefertiti shown on the previous slide. The mummy on the right, however, has been confirmed to be Queen T, the grandmother of Tutankhamun. For many years, scholars debated Queen T's ancestry, and there are many facial reconstructions of what she may have looked like in death. Some reconstructions display her with more European features. Others display her with more Middle Eastern and Near Eastern features, and others display her with more African features. Facial reconstructions, while based on some level of anthropological science, also contain an element of artistry as well. And so I've included them here for the interest of viewers rather than as scientific fact. In the middle of the New Kingdom, a pharaoh named Akhenaten ruled. Akhenaten is notable because he tried to move ancient Egyptian society away from its cherished polytheistic religion towards a monotheistic religion based around the worship of Aten, the sun disk. This change did not go over well in Egyptian society. And as soon as Akhenaten died, the ancient Egyptians reverted back to their polytheistic traditions. What's interesting about Akhenaten is the way he's portrayed in both two-dimensional artwork and 3D sculpture. He's shown with a very long face and is being very thin, almost emaciated. Two-dimensional artwork shows him with skinny arms and a distended stomach. It also shows his children, possibly King Tut, with a misshapen head as well. We know that the ancient Egyptian family trees were very mixed up and that they frequently married their brothers and sisters and cousins. So it's possible that there may have been inbreeding or it's possible that Akhenaten was just trying to experiment with new types of art. We don't know for sure though, because much of the art depicting Akhenaten was destroyed after his death. Even his mummified remains are very poorly preserved and are not much more than a skeleton, suggesting that Egyptians after Akhenaten's death tried not only to destroy the artwork depicting the Pharaoh, the controversial Pharaoh, but may have even tried to destroy his body as well. Now we'll discuss one of Egypt's most famous pharaohs, King Tutankhamun, also known as King Tut. King Tut was the son of Akhenaten, and he ruled Egypt from about 1332 to 1323 BCE. He had a brief reign. His policy was mostly returning ancient Egypt back to polytheistic. He gained the throne as a boy and died at the age of 19. Archaeologists debate his cause of death and the circumstances under which he was mummified and buried. What they agree on is that he was rapidly buried, probably in a tomb and with grave goods that were not his own. Unlike most other pharaohs from the period, his tomb remained undisturbed probably because it was in a location that was not originally intended for him. His tomb was first documented by British archeologists Howard Carter in 1922. Carter excavated the tomb and brought many of the artifacts to London where they were displayed in the British Museum. After the excavation of King Tut's tomb, there was the rumor of the curse of King Tut as Howard Carter's benefactor, Lord Carnarvon, died under mysterious circumstances. Carter himself, though, died of natural causes decades later. The curse of King Tut just highlights the supernatural qualities that regular people often ascribe to artifacts, discussed in the first lecture in this course. Here are some images of Howard Carter and his excavation of King Tut's tomb. Here are some photographs taken by Carter's team of King Tut's tomb and the artifacts that they found. As you can see, the tomb is very small and cluttered. 
It was probably not a pharaoh's tomb, but a tomb built for a lesser official. Once again, because Tutankhamun died when he was 19 years old, there would not have been enough time to finish his proper tomb as a result of his untimely death. We can see a variety of artifacts in this tomb, including furniture, these round objects, many archeologists think are meant to represent loaves of bread. We can also see spare wheels for his chariot. Chariots would have been very important to the ancient Egyptians, not only as a military technology, they were the tanks of the ancient world, but as a vehicle for traveling. They also would have been the sports cars of the ancient world. Here are some images of Tutankhamun's iconic death mask and sarcophagi. As you can see, they're covered in gold, but some scholars think that they were not originally intended for Tutankhamun's use. They think they may have been composites that were rapidly put together to accommodate his burial. King Tut's mummy will be shown on the next slide. King Tutankhamun's mummy showed signs of both pre-mortem injuries and post-mortem damage. Scientists disagree on King Tut's cause of death. They've postulated a variety of theories, assassination, a chariot accident, combat wounds, even diseases, possibly even an impacted wisdom tooth that became infected. Personally, I think a chariot accident or combat wounds make the most sense being that ancient Egypt at the time was at war with other civilizations. We should also keep in mind, though, that King Tut had a series of other congenital disorders, much like his father, Akhenaten, that would have made his life very difficult. He may have had a club foot, for example, that would have prevented him from walking normally. This may have made him less balanced, which may have caused him to fall off his chariot, or may have made him more vulnerable in combat as well. King Tut's remains toured the world and were seen in many countries, but they have since been repatriated to the Egyptian nation and they've been reinterred in his tomb. Scientists have also done a facial reconstruction of King Tut, what he may have looked like. I think this is probably a more reliable facial reconstruction than the ones shown on previous slides. They show that he has an elongated head, perhaps like his father Akhenaten, the facial reconstructions of other parts of his body also show that he had issues like a club foot, for example. Anyway, we'll continue on now. We'll continue by discussing more of the artifacts in King Tut's tomb. Here you can see one of his chariots that he was buried with. It's covered in gold, very befitting of a pharaoh. By the way, gold was actually not the most valuable of all metals to the ancient Egyptians. Silver was. The ancient Egyptians had access to gold, easier access to gold than silver. Hence, silver was more valuable in their society. On the right are Shabtis. Shabtis were figurines that were buried with later pharaohs during the New Kingdom, and they were symbolized to come alive as servants to serve the pharaoh in death, much more humane and preferable than human sacrificial victims. On the right here is another image of King Tut's grave goods. Once again, we see furniture, items meant to represent food, chairs, and chariot wheels, highlighting that the pharaoh probably liked riding chariots and wanted to be able to use them even in death. Here are some examples of artwork, two-dimensional artwork in King Tut's tomb. The artwork in his tomb is pretty good. It's not as good as other artwork from the period. Once again, highlighting that his death happened in an unti untimely manner and there was not enough time to properly prepare for the Pharaoh's burial. Now we'll discuss some of the monumental architecture of the New Kingdom, especially the temples. Perhaps the best example is the Temple of Karnak, shown here. It has ornate columns 
whose shafts are decorated with hieroglyphics and other carvings. And its capitals, shown here, have been decorated with papyrus. Papyrus was a very important resource to the ancient Egyptians. A type of reed that grew on the banks of the Nile River, papyrus could be turned into a type of paper. The ancient Egyptians preferred to keep records on papyrus, whereas other civilizations, like the ancient Mesopotamians and Sumerians, preferred to keep records on clay tablets. We can also see the avenue approaching the temple would have been lined with Sphinx statues, although most of them had now been severely damaged. Now we can discuss some of the monumental artwork and architecture of the New Kingdom tombs, especially in the Valley of the Kings. The New Kingdom tombs were meant to be secret, unlike the pyramids of the Old Kingdom. They were built into the remote cliffs of Upper Egypt, far away from settlements and cities. Although there would have been some guards and priests who lived near the tombs to provide security and to make sacrifices in the name of the pharaohs. The pharaohs ordered their tombs to be well decorated on the interior to compensate for them having to be concealed. Here's a diagram of the shaft of a tomb in the Valley of the Kings. As you can see, they're built deep into the cliff walls. Most of the larger tombs were robbed, although it probably took longer for the robbers to find and break into these tombs. The tombs became less ornate at the end of the New Kingdom as Egypt entered a period of permanent decline. By the way, one of the reasons that King Tut's tomb remained undiscovered was because he was not buried in a tomb fit for a pharaoh. He was buried in a much smaller tomb in a less prestigious location of the Valley of the Kings. So tomb robbers would not have been looking for his tomb, allowing it to be discovered in the 1920s of the Common Era. Now we'll discuss one more very important pharaoh of the New Kingdom. Ramses II, also known as Ramses the Great. Ramses ruled from 1279 to 1213 BCE, over 66 years. He was a powerful warrior king who expanded Egypt's territory to the north, northeast, south, and west. He built temples and commissioned statues and artwork to commemorate his many military successes. While Ramses was military successful, his descendants could not maintain the expanded empire that he built for them. Ramses' mummy will be displayed on the next slide. Ramses' mummy is fairly well preserved, much better than the mummy of King Tutankhamun. Scholars have also made facial reconstructions of what they think Ramses may have looked like in life. And a study done on his mummy in the 1970s suggested that he probably actually had very light hair, perhaps light blonde or even auburn. Although some scholars disagree on this point and argue that he probably would have had darker features. I've included facial reconstructions of both arguments here on this slide. Because of his numerous military exploits, Ramses the Great has been portrayed in popular culture. He was the subject of Percy Shelley's poem, Ozymandias. Ozymandias is a Greek spelling of Ramses. It is also thought that Ramses was the pharaoh who ruled Egypt at the time of the Israelites' legendary flight from Egypt after their 400-year period of enslavement. Archaeologists and scholars debate whether the ancient Israelites' time in Egypt occurred or whether it was a mythical event. Either way, this story highlights the fame that Ramses achieved. The ancient Egyptian civilization began to decline after the New Kingdom. Starting in the 1100s BCE, during a period called the Bronze Age Collapse, to be fair to Egypt, many other civilizations fell during this period, but the Egyptians did not have a resurgence after the Bronze Age Collapse the way other civilizations did. 
the Egyptians endured invasions from new groups of people called the Sea People. The Sea People were a confederation of seafaring tribes from Europe and Central Asia that made raids all along the eastern Mediterranean coast. They're depicted on the right-hand side of this slide. The Egyptians also faced invasions from the Libyans as well, coming from the west. After the Bronze Age collapse and during the Iron Age, the Egyptians continued to face foreign invasions. They dealt with invasions from the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Achaemenid Empire from the 700s through the 500s and even as late as the 300s BCE. Egypt's period of independence had come to an end. Eventually, as the classical civilizations of the Greeks and the Romans turned their attention to Egypt. The Hellenistic Greeks under Alexander the Great invaded Egypt in 332 BCE, defeating the Achaemenid Persians in the image at left. The Egyptians welcomed the Greeks as liberators. Unlike other foreign conquerors, the Greeks adopted many additional elements of Egyptian culture and religion, even calling themselves pharaohs. The Achaemenids did this as well, but they did it in a much more cynical way. The Egyptians appreciated how Alexander and the Greeks adopted elements of their culture and felt that the Greeks were much more sincere in their adoption of Egyptian religion and Egyptian culture. Alexander the Great commissioned the construction of Alexandria around 331 BCE. It was meant to be a port city in the Nile Delta. Later on, Alexandria would have the Pharos Lighthouse from about 284 to 246 BCE, shown in the middle. Alexander the Great liked Egyptian culture so much that he had himself buried in the city of Alexandria around 323 BCE. Alexander's general Ptolemy and his descendants ruled Egypt until the Romans took over about 300 years later. The most famous Ptolemy was Cleopatra VII, the last Egyptian pharaoh that was official. Some of the Romans refer to themselves as pharaohs, but most scholars consider the dynasty of the pharaohs to have come to an end with Cleopatra VII. We'll look at some images of Cleopatra on the next slide. Now we'll discuss Cleopatra VII who is generally regarded by Egyptologists and historians as the last Egyptian pharaoh. Cleopatra lived from 69 to 30 BCE, and although she was of Greek descent, she represented herself as an Egyptian pharaoh in uh, her visual art. She also represented herself in a more Greco-Roman uh, fashion as well. It's also believed that um, Cleopatra was the only uh, Ptolemy uh, ruler that could actually speak the Egyptian language, which is very interesting. Um, Cleopatra had relationships with important Roman leaders like Julius Caesar and Mark Antony in order to make uh, alliances with the rapidly expanding uh, Roman Republic, which was extending its um, territorial holdings across the Mediterranean at the time. Unfortunately for Cleopatra, she was on uh, the losing side uh, in the last of the Roman civil wars, um, and she had to uh, commit suicide in order to avoid uh, being captured and disgraced by the Romans. Uh, with her death uh, comes the end of Ptolemaic or Greek rule of Egypt, uh, ushering in Roman rule. Um, Roman leaders in Egypt were sometimes referred to as pharaohs, but as I said before, Egyptologists generally consider Cleopatra to be the last um, Egyptian pharaoh, even though she was uh, of Greek ancestry. And this is because the Romans dismantled uh, many Egyptian religious and cultural traditions as they were bringing uh, Egypt into their uh, empire. 
And of course, people have been fascinated with Cleopatra, both in antiquity all the way down to the present. As a result, there's many portrayals of her. Uh, busts, statues, paintings, even coins uh, feature Cleopatra's likeness. We'll talk more about Cleopatra later in this course. After the death of Cleopatra, about 39 BCE, the Romans took control of Egypt and ruled the country for over 300 years. The Romans syncretized many elements of Greco-Roman culture with Egyptian culture, as seen on this slide. Roman Egyptian art moved away from the profile style that was iconic of earlier Egyptian two-dimensional artwork, as seen in this fresco here, where the subject is looking directly at the audience. She's also reclining in a very Greco-Roman style. Still, this fresco contains an image of a falcon, presumably Horus or Ra, showing that there's elements of Egyptian religion, even during Roman rule. Another element of syncretism between Roman and Egyptian culture is this statue thought to be of Horus. He's portrayed with a very Greco-Roman style of body and clothing and with a very anatomically realistic jackal head, unlike how the Egyptians in previous millennia portrayed their god of mummification. The Egyptians taught the Romans about mummification, and some Romans living in Egypt even had their bodies mummified, although they generally spent much less money on having their mummies made and they were buried much more simply with painted death masks seen here and here. The Romans also syncretized other elements of their culture in their statuary and artwork, like this bust here, which displays a very Greco-Roman style male wearing an Egyptian headdress. Conclusion. Ancient Egypt was one of the longest running of all the ancient civilizations, lasting over 3,000 years. Uh, ancient Egypt had a significant impact on uh, surrounding civilizations, including the Greeks and the Romans, the primary subject of this course. Uh, the Greeks and the Romans learned architectural and sculptural techniques from the Egyptians. Uh, they also gained some spiritual and medical knowledge from uh, the Egyptians as well. Um, the Egyptian civilization exhibited important continuities throughout its long history uh, during its old, middle, and new kingdoms. And even during its intermediate periods and even after the uh, Egyptian civilization lost its independence, many of these continuities would continue. Uh, some of these continuities will include monumental architecture, sculpture, temples and tombs, um, the ancient Egyptian religion, its polytheistic religion of gods and goddesses, and then, of course, its burial rites, especially mummification. And because the Egyptian civilization has been around for so long and has produced such a rich collection of artifacts and such a rich culture, it has fascinated people from ancient times all the way to the present. It fascinated the Greeks and the Romans in the past, just as it fascinates us today.